Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. We arranged it about 10 minutes ago. It's not going to be under the same link because I can't get it back. Oh. But we are streaming to our YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you want to send, you could send it out again. There were two people on. Um, is there a way that we could go to that one and put in the chat the new link? No. Nope. Oh, it just is gone <laughs> forever. But now there is somebody on it. So I think people are figuring it out. Awesome. There's some, you don't have to sit at the front, but there are some chairs up front if you'd like a front or a seat. And we might as well, since some of you are family members or household members, you might as well cluster closer in. Closer together with the people you live with, because that'll give a little extra space. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Katie Gavetis. I'm the program director here at the Center for Alaskan Coastal Sites, and I'm going to talk a little bit about sea star wasting syndrome and an update on the status of sea stars in Kachemak Bay. If you have any questions, feel free to like shout them out, raise your hand dance around, um, you can definitely interrupt me. If you are watching online, uh, you can type your questions in the chat and we'll get to them eventually. Um, and there will also be time at the end for questions as well, but I don't mind being interrupted. If you aren't familiar with the Center for Alaskan Coastal Studies, we are an environmental education and stewardship nonprofit that works here in Homer and Kachemak Bay more broadly. Um, we are a private nonprofit, so we're not affiliated with any particular university or government entity, though we do partner with a lot of different government organizations at universities and schools. Uh, if you're not here in the room or watching from at home in the Kachemak Bay region, this is where we are located um, in Kachemak Bay, Alaska. And um, the lands and waters that we live and work on are the traditional lands of the Denina and Supiak people. And we recognize their indigenous sovereignty and strive to uphold that and very much appreciate their stewardship of this place, past, present, and into the future. And this place is an incredibly special place in so many different ways. Today we're gonna to talk most specifically about the intertidal zone. So that's the area between the high tide line and the low tide line in Kachemak Bay that's exposed generally two times a day at low tide as the water moves up, vast expanses of beach can be exposed. And we're gonna be looking specifically at the rocky intertidal because that's where most of the sea stars that we're talking about live. Some of them are subtidal species, so that means they actually live in the waters below the intertidal zone and are only out of the water at really, really extreme low tides. This is one of our most common sea stars that we see in the intertidal area. This is the true star, also sometimes called the false ochre star or the mottled star, so many common names. The scientific name is Asterius trichelli, um, and they, like I said, they live in the intertidal zone. They like to eat mussels and clams, other bivalves, barnacles, things like that. So when you see mussels or clams, that's kind of the zone of the beach that typically um, you would see true stars like this. Um, going farther down the beach, we sometimes start to encounter sunflower stars, and these can grow to be up to a meter wide, so they're huge. They're the second fastest recorded sea star, which is pretty exciting. And they use their thousands of tube, tube feet powered by their hydrovascular system to cruise around on the ocean floor and in that intertidal area. And they're feeding on really anything that they can catch. So this includes clams and mussels and bivalves, but also faster things like sea urchins are a favorite prey item for them. Two other sea stars that are kind of notable in this conversation about sea star racing syndrome are the leather star, um, which is on the right for you all, and then the ochre star, which is on the left. Um, and we'll talk a little more specifically about the ochre star later on, 
Um, but the leather stars are really interesting because they actually seem to be a species that wasn't strongly affected by sea star wasting syndrome. So there's a lot of you know, questions and mysteries around why that might be. There are a vast array of other species of sea stars in Kachemak Bay and especially beyond Kachemak Bay, um, but four that are noteworthy from left to right are the Stimson Sun Star, the Rose Star, the Blood Star, and the Red Banded or Rainbow Sea Star. So quite an amazing diversity here in Kachemak Bay, which makes tide pooling at these really amazing low tides incredible. And also these sea stars play really important roles in the ecosystem and they have different niches. So some of them are feeding on bivalves, some of them, like the sun star, are feeding on other sea stars or sea cucumbers. The blood star is more of a detritivore, so feeding more so on detritus in the water and plankton and things like that. So they each have their own role, but many of them are really important kind of shaping the community structure of the ecosystems. Any questions so far? So, we're gonna dive a little bit more into what sea star wasting syndrome is, um, and then talk about some updates of what we've been seeing in Kachemak Bay. Uh, so sea star wasting syndrome, it's important to note it's a syndrome. There's no definitive test or disease known behind sea star wasting syndrome. So you can't really say sea star wasting disease, um, though sometimes you'll hear that um, being used. But if you really dive into what's going on, it's vague enough that most people are calling it a syndrome, not a disease. And generally this starts, at least the signs that we can see, start with white lesions on the skin of the sea star. Um, and if you really wanna get into the specifics of this, not only is it a white patch, but it kind of is, is an area that's missing some tissue. So it looks like a, sort of there's a gouge in there, there's a depression in the skin there. Um, and then as it progresses, the tissue around the lesion starts to decay. The rays of the sea star um, begin to deteriorate and fall apart. And in extreme cases, you end up with death. Not always. Um, we've definitely observed some sea stars that appear to have recovered just fine from this. Um, but then some of them also do not survive, do not make it. Um, so that's kind of what sea star wasting syndrome is. Now we're going to dive into what we've been doing at Coastal Studies and monitoring. Um, so in 2014, we were fortunate because sea star wasting syndrome was affecting areas farther south first, we had some time to prepare. And in 2013 and 2014, uh, scientists and community members in California, Washington, Oregon, British Columbia, and and eventually um, until a little later in Mexico, but also down in Baja, um, we're observing this phenomenon of major die-offs of sea stars across a wide range of species. And so we began working with the multi-agency Rocky Intertidal Network, or the Marine Network, to adapt the protocols they have for collecting data about sea stars for our beaches here. And we rolled out those surveys starting in the summer of 2014 um, at three locations, uh, China Poop Bay, Otter Rock in Peterson Bay, and Peterson Lagoon in Peterson Bay. And we chose these locations because they have different um, types of substrate, so materials that make up the beach. Um, you know, China Poop Bay is a little bit more muddy with some larger rocks. Otter Rock is big, giant boulders, kind of bedrock. Peterson Lagoon is more sand with smaller rocks, and so it has a different substrate. Different, different amounts of human impact, different wave action, different sort of whether it's a protected shallow bay or a more exposed bay, as well as different inputs of fresh water. So we tried to kind of go across a variety of environmental gradients, and they're all within a mile of our Peterson Bay Field Station. So we can get out there fairly regularly to do these surveys. Um, and so we started collecting data in summer of 2014. Like I said, we do, um, we do the surveys at least four times a year. So once in the fall, once in the winter, once in the spring. And oftentimes we'll actually do it multiple times over the course of the summer because we're at the field station more frequently and because that's when we've actually seen more variability 
in what's going on with the success. Um, one of the really cool things about the Sea Star Wasting Syndrome surveys is that we've been able to take this and turn it into a way for um, all of us to kind of learn together and turn it into an educational activity. So we've had upper elementary, middle school, high school, college students collecting data um, through their classes and we've built activities around this to really support the learning, whether that be data analysis or creation of art or communicating the information to other people. Um, and they've gone on kind of inspired by this to share the information more broadly and, um, and kind of understand why C stars are important, but also be able to contribute to uh, those data that we are collecting. So it's a pretty cool opportunity for some rich and meaningful learning around a pretty challenging and complex topic. I mean, like I said earlier, researchers still don't really understand why it's happening. Um, but we're able to have sixth graders out there helping us document that it is happening and helping to develop a better understanding of what might be going on. And we're especially grateful for those who help us out in the fall, winter, and spring surveys because they are not necessarily as beautiful and sunny as some of the summer surveys can be. In the winter, oftentimes it takes place at night because that's when the best low tides are and because winter is mostly night anyway. Um, so it can be cold be dark um, and in the fall and spring oftentimes this, the surveys are taking place in blowing wind and sideways rain and things like that. So we appreciate everyone who has volunteered in this project um, to help contribute to our understanding of what's going on. And I wanted to share um, this quote from a participant, a youth participant in the Sea Star Wasting Surveys um, because it really brings home that this can be an important and meaningful learning experience um, and that engaging people in being part of this data collection helps us all to understand more of what's going on and to be able to contribute meaningfully to kind of untangling this issue and getting to the bottom of what's happening here in Catramacta. And the data that are collected are really, really useful. Um, so we've been able to contribute to data to papers that have been written, um, to presentations at conferences. Most recently, a proposal went into the IUCN Red List to list sunflower stars as critically endangered, and data from these surveys were included in that. And we've been collaborating more and more with research partners in the area, which is really exciting because the closer communication we are with them, the better information we have to share with students and community members, the more excited students and community members are to help collect the data. And it's this really wonderful feedback cycle, um, which so much in my job, we talk about negative feedbacks or positive feedback loops that are bad, that are negative. But this is an example of a positive feedback loop that is actually a really positive thing um, for our community and hopefully our ecosystems as well. So let's dive into those data. What have we been observing at those three locations? Again, Peterson, Lagoon, Otter Rock, and China Poop Bay. Prior to 2014, we had about, or 2016, we had about two years where we were making observations and collecting data. And we did regularly see mild signs of sea star wasting syndrome at all three of those locations. So we weren't starting from a completely healthy population when we started observing and documenting this in 2014. There was already signs of sea star wasting syndrome. Depending on the survey, it was about zero to 20% of the true stars that we were counting and measuring had signs of sea star wasting syndrome. And every once in a while, we would find a sunflower star with signs. So out of 100 sunflower stars that we counted, during our surveys, about four of them had evidence of sea star wasting syndrome. That all changed really dramatically at the end of the summer, beginning of the fall 2016. Um, so it started first with the sunflower stars. There was a massive die off of sunflower stars at Otter Rock and China Poop Bay. And we also heard from uh, community members and partners around Kachemak Bay that this was happening in Jackalock Bay and Hesketh Island and other locations at about the same time. So remember, prior to this, we had seen four sunflower stars with signs of sea star wasting syndrome. In just two surveys, we found 13 sunflower stars with severe symptoms 
of wasting. And um, pretty soon they were just sort of reduced to goo piles, which I'll show you in the next slide. And then in the true star, we started to see an increase in how severe the signs were and how many sea stars were showing these signs. And um, we, the rack line, so that's kind of where the algae washes up along the shore and the driftwood. For the first, the last couple of weeks of August and the first few weeks of September 2016, the rack line was just filled with the detached rays of sea stars. So it just looked like they had been pulled apart and thrown along the beach. It was, it was a pretty gruesome sight. Um, and here's some examples of what we were seeing with the sunflower stars. By late September and early October 2016, so just a month after this, there was no sign of sunflower stars at any of the locations where we survey. Um, so their population, at least in that kind of intertidal subtidal zone, um, in the spots we were looking, their population pretty much completely disappeared over the course of about a month. And um, later in September is when we really started to see the true star population decline. And again, by the beginning of October, it was really rare to see a true star. Um, whereas before, we, when we would go out, we were typically counting 50, 75, 100 true stars in those plots. Um, so a really significant decline in their numbers. Our surveys are more designed to look at the prevalence of, of the symptoms, not to get a really accurate count of the sea stars, because sea stars are very mobile, and so they can move in and out of your permanent plot, and there's no good way to tag them. But we can get a general sense if you go from 100 to zero, that's a big deal. Um, and especially if you go from 100 to zero and then stay at zero for a year, that's a really big deal. And that's exactly what we were observing and what lots of other people around Kachanak Bay were observing as well. And many other sea star species as well sort of disappeared at this time. So what then? Well, um, over the past four years with the true stars, we've seen a pretty slow but steady um, recovery or at least evidence of recovery that's going on. Mm -hmm. So about a year later in 2017, we started to see little tiny juvenile true stars out at Otter Rock. And then shortly thereafter, a few months later, we started to see a handful of adults again out at Otter Rock. Um, the most recent survey we did, there were over 200 true stars out there at Otter Rock. For those of you who are personally in the space, it's the size of this room, the area that we were counting true stars in. Um, so that's a really high population density. It's actually higher than what we were typically seeing before the die-off event. It's been a little bit slower in China Poop Bay and Peterson Lagoon, um, but we are starting to see a few sea stars back in those locations. And typically now when we're doing the counts, it's about 10 to 25 um, true stars that we're seeing in those spots. So it's lower than it was before, but we are seeing them and they are, we think adults, turns out, not many people, well, as far as I know, no one really knows how quickly true stars or sunflower stars grow in the wild. So this, this distinction between juvenile and adult is really a distinction between small and big, um, but we use it as a proxy for juvenile and adult. What about the sunflower stars? Sunflower, oh, I skipped ahead. Really interesting <laughs> tidbit. So ochre stars, or Pisaster apricius, are very common um, farther south and up into southeast Alaska and even Prince William Sound. They were kind of, they are the dominant intertidal sea star throughout most of the west coast of North America. And these were one of the species that was really well studied with sea star wasting syndrome. It's one of the ones where signs were first documented in this. So we adapted our protocol to not look at ochre stars because we didn't really see them in our locations and we were looking just at true stars. Every once in a while there might be one that showed up, like one ochre star a year out there at Otter Rock. In outer Kachemak Bay, closer to Jackalock Bay, Kasitz Miseldovia area, it is more common to see these ochre stars. But in inner Kachemak Bay where we were working, it just wasn't a thing that was really worth counting because there weren't very many of them. But after the die off in 2016, we started to see more and more of these ochre stars. And in fact, at first, when we were seeing the juvenile true star recruitment, it was pretty even numbers with juvenile or small, honestly, just small 
uh, Ochre Star recruitment happening there at Otter Rock. And since then, the True Stars seem to have gotten a little bit of an upper hand. There are two or three times as many True Stars as Ochre Stars, but we're seeing, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 Ochre Stars, where before it'd be unusual to see more than one. Um, so it does seem like there's been a little bit of a shift in the community structure. And if anyone has any insights on this, I definitely would love to hear thoughts or ideas about what might be going on there. Now for the sunflower stars, the recovery here, if it's happening, is happening a lot more slowly than with the true stars, but it's also really rare compared to pretty much everywhere else in the sunflower stars range. So it's noteworthy that within about a year and a half of the die-off, they're started, we started to see small sunflower stars in low numbers. So one, two, three. We were really excited about that um, in the past four years to be able to see just a handful of sunflower stars here and there at the Otter Rock location. So much like the true stars, for the sunflower stars, it seems like Otter Rock has been in some ways a little bit of a refuge for them. That's where the recovery, if it's happening, has been happening the fastest. Um, and then this past year, really exciting, um, in February, Shannon and Seth, two of our um, staff here, were out at Otter Rock doing the survey and they recorded 40 sunflower stars, um, which is more than we were recording before the sea star wasting syndrome, uh, syndrome die off. And since then, the numbers kind of stabilized a little bit. That seems like maybe it was, it was a bit of an anomaly, but this summer, our surveys, we've seen four, seven and 18 sunflower stars over the past few months in the survey area. And then while we've been time pooling, we've seen additional ones around. So it does seem like there is a population of small sunflower stars that's pretty well established there at Otter Rock. We're gonna keep a really close eye on them because one of the things that was observed farther south is that there were these recoveries and then there was a second round of die off So, um, we're, we're paying close attention and really trying to um, keep track of what's going on there. Um, and of note, these sunflower stars that we're seeing are starting to get a little bit larger. So at first they were palm sized, then they were maybe hand sized. Now we're looking at some that are 25 centimeters in diameter. So they're, they're getting there. That's a quarter of what the maximum adult size could be. So they're definitely not large sunflower stars yet but they do be, seem to be surviving for multiple years um, based on the limited information we have on their growth rates. Um, another really cool thing that we saw this June is that sunflower stars and true stars were spotted spawning out at Otter Rock. Um, so they are reproducing, or at least they're spawning, whether or not they're successfully, the gametes are successfully being fertilized remains to be seen, but it's exciting to know that even though they're small, even though they're a quarter of the maximum size, they are sexually mature and able to spawn. So um, that definitely is really going to be interesting to see um, what happens from here. So kind of, we'll move a little bit beyond our little area where we survey and talk about some partners and the work that they're doing. Um, but again, wanted to open it up if there are any questions at this time. Yeah. Do you know what it is about Otter Rock that makes them start there versus the other No, it's a really good question. In fact, it's a really interesting question for the sunflower stars, especially because prior to this, at least going back like the 20, 25 years that we have institutional knowledge of, China Poot Bay was where the sunflower stars really were located. And it was fairly rare to see them at Otter Rock. China Poot Bay, you might see 10 or 20 or on a really good tide, 30 large mature sunflower stars and Otter Rock, you might find a couple and they tend to be a little bit smaller for the most part. Um, so really interesting that that shifted. Um, at the very end, uh, I can share a couple slides on a new theory that's emerged that has to do with um, what might be causing sea star wasting syndrome. And there's some links there with the environmental conditions at Otter Rock versus China Poop Bay or Peterson Lagoon. Um, but it's very much conjecture at this point as to why Otter Rock might be a better spot for them. Any other questions or comments? 
Any questions coming in online, Henry? No, they're not. <laughs> Is anyone watching online, Henry? Yes. Excellent. Hi out there. <laughs> Um, so one of the uh, research groups that we've started to work a little bit more closely with and we're really happy to um, be in communication with is the EBSCOR Fire and Ice Project, and specifically the team that's looking at the coastal margins. So this project is based out of UAF, UAS, and UAA, so it's a kind of inter-college project, that's where the funding comes from as we bring these three universities together. Um, and they have multiple research goals, but the one that's most relevant to the work that we do with sea stars and intertidal monitoring most more broadly is the second goal here. So they're working to quantify the biological response of the nearshore marine organisms to varying levels of glacial input. So as the climate is changing and our glaciers are melting, they're trying to get a sense of how this is affecting what's happening in that intertidal and nearshore environment. Um, and the research is happening both in Lynn Canal in Southeast Alaska and in Kachemak Bay. So there are at least, there's five, sometimes more sites in Kachemak Bay that they're regularly collecting data about. And so we're able to kind of compare, hey, what did you see up by Gruen Glacier compared to what we saw at Otter Rock? And um, though our data are collected in a very different way, we're looking at some ways to kind of synthesize and be able to to share with them what we've been doing because we're able to have a much finer kind of temporal scale and we're able to be able to say, well, you know, when we did our survey today, we didn't see as many, but yesterday when we were out there with the group, we saw this or we saw that. And so there can be a lot more detail in the work that we're doing on a very small scale and then how do you expand out from there and communicate with these larger spatial scales um, and these more um, in-depth research projects. So it's been exciting to work with them and to compare notes across different locations. And then we're also part of the Pycnopodia Working Group. Um, Pycnopodia helianthoides is the scientific name for sunflower stars. And so um, this working group just submitted a proposal to the IUCN Red List to list sunflower stars as critically endangered. And I pulled a couple of um, slides from that draft proposal to share with you all um, just kind of how dramatic the decline in sunflower star populations have been. So if we actually start over here on the right side for you, um, we are kind of in that purpley colors. And on the left, the bar is the density of sunflower stars in shallow depth, so less than 25 meters, um, prior to the sea star wasting syndrome die off of it, and then after. So you can see the significant magnitude or significant decrease in the density of sunflower stars recorded in shallow depths, and a similar pattern appears in, in deeper depths. And then this breaks it out, the population size estimates. Gray, this black dotted line, um, indicates sort of when sea star wasting syndrome hit farther south. It's early for us. Um, so you can see in the Gulf of Alaska, that's a little bit farther over but you can sort of see how that population decline um, has happened in these other locations as well as in the Gulf of Alaska too. So we're kind of part of this bigger trend, but in most places, the numbers are really, 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 really low now for sunflower stars. And so it's notable that we're really seeing any here in Kachemak Bay. Um, in some ways, we're kind of the exception. The, the Alaska into British Columbia and a little bit into, um, Northern Washington are areas where there seem to be some populations of sunflower stars left. But as we get farther south, um, especially in the California, it seems like they've almost been entirely extirpated there. Is, it, is there anything for what's going on in the Aleutian? Is that what that says up there? Yeah, sorry, it's a little bit blurry. Um, there's only a little bit of data for the Aleutians. And um, the most recent, I think, data collection in the Aleutians was 2017, by my knowledge. So. Uh, not quite as much information of what's going on with the sunflower stars. But I know there's hope to do more work out there soon. Um, and then getting a little bit more specific with the Pycnopodia or the sunflower star information, we've also been um, contributing to a project looking at genetic 
um, sequences in sunflower stars and if there's certain um, genetic like predispositions to sea star wasting syndrome. Um, and also this project is also looking at um, you know, what the genetic information can tell us about potential for recovery or even captive breeding. Um, so this is based out of the University of California and we've been working with a couple of researchers there. They sent a kit up and we've actually collected two feet from sunflower stars out at Otter Rock that we'll be sending back to them for genetic analysis and to contribute to their project. And it's very detailed information about what they're doing with their project. But really, um, there's not a lot of genetic information about sunflower stars or sea stars at all. Um, so they're trying to kind of gather as much information as they can and really hone in on this question of, do sea stars with symptoms have slightly different genetic uh, markers than sea stars without symptoms? Um, and how has how have populations that maybe haven't been affected, do those populations have a wider genetic diversity than these populations that have been really severely um, kind of constrained and, and killed off by sea star wasting syndrome? Um, so yeah, what are the signatures of susceptibility? And um, really then starting to, they're interested, especially in California, the impacts of sea star wasting syndrome have rippled out from there. So the sunflower stars, feed on, among other things, sea urchins. The sea urchins feed on kelp. And so in the absence of those sunflower star predators, the, kelp po or the urchin populations have really grown and the kelp forest ecosystems have been really um, constrained by that. And a lot of the kelp forests have actually died out. And so restoring Pycnopodia may be a way to help boost back those kelp forest ecosystems, but there's a lot of questions around that. Um, so this is us using two feet collected by collaborators. That was us out there a few weeks ago with tiny scissors in the intertidal zone at Otter Rock as the tide was coming back in, racing to collect 10 to 12 tube feet from each sunflower star that we found out there. And then another um, project that we've been involved with that is much bigger picture is pri the Prime Network. So this is an emerging network. Well, that's I shouldn't have said emerging because that's what the name means. This is a network that's being built around emerging diseases in the marine environment. So it's a group that seeks to kind of observe, document, respond to, and ideally um, help ecosystems and communities recover in the case of emerging diseases in the marine environment, whether that be in sea stars or orca whales or salmon or eelgrass, um, so it's designed across a lot of, we don't know what's coming next, but we know that our coasts are changing and trying to plan ahead so that we can respond better to the next time something like sea star wasting syndrome happens. And with that, I would like to thank all of our volunteers and collaborators who have been a part of this project over the past seven years. It's been really fun to work with community members, to work with students, to work with scientists on this question. And even though it's a sort of topic that's difficult because it's something that we love that's been dramatically affected by this unknown thing that's killing them off, um, it's been really fascinating and wonderful to be part of a community of people who are willing to dig in and ask questions and get out there in the dark, snowy winter um, to try to understand what's going on with the sea stars and how we can be involved in stewarding these ecosystems into the future. And you can do it too. Um, so we've had volunteers involved in the past. This year especially we're trying to broaden out um, volunteer involvement as part of Coastwalk and beyond Coastwalk. Um, so we have some opportunities coming up to get involved with sea star wasting syndrome monitoring at Peterson Bay or to get involved with a modified sea star wasting syndrome survey as part of your coast walk walk um, and Henry will be doing a training on that uh, September 19th on the Homer side and we also have some opportunities over at Peterson Bay on September 19th and 20th uh, to get over there and help us out with one of these surveys. So we'd love for you to join us in any way that you can um, and we are very open to questions that you all might have. Thank you. Thank you.
Any questions? If not, I'll return to our question. Okay. I'm going to let you all ask questions. Well, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I was just going to ask about the differences between those three sites. I'm not even guess, but I don't know if it's going to be right. Yeah, so, well, what's your guess? Anyway? My guess is wave action. Oh, tell me more. So, I mean, my guess is wave action increasing oxygenated water. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is kind of my guess, too. And in order for that to make sense, I'm gonna share with you. Oh, Beth has a guess. Well, I, I mean, I think about sunscreen too, because well, the lagoon and kind of these are very um, muddy, silky, and other rocks probably in the rocky. So I just wonder if that also doesn't play into that. Yeah, and I, you know, it's hard, unless we write these things down, it's hard to know for sure if our memory is serving us right. But I feel like China Poop Bay has gotten more sedimenty and more muddy over the last five years. And I don't know if that has to do with the shifting of that side channel from the Wasmasensky River or changes the mussel population because with fewer true stars, the mussel population has expanded and they, they poop a lot and it creates this really sticky sediment. Um, so I'm not sure if that was a natural progression or affected by sea star wasting syndrome, or if I'm making it up. But it feels like it's gotten it's muckier yeah. out there. It, it'd be really hard to separate the two anyways. Yeah. At least in our sites. Yes. But the, that glacial study piece that they're doing with the fire and ice project, it'd be really interesting to look at that over time if the more glacially influenced sites see recovery faster or slower or not at all. Is there something that um, Otter Rock has in common with the Aleutian Islands since they didn't seem to be taking part of the head of the other places? Well, I think that the wave action and the substrate piece would be similar um, in terms of the Aleutian Islands tend to be a much more rocky coastline. There's not as many sheltered spots. Um, but I don't know also exactly what sites in the Aleutians have been studied. That would be something that's worth looking into more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's good thing you're looking at. Oh, yes. Henry can point it out to you. Are you glad that it got captured on live stream? Maybe the live is fine. Something that's pretty cool right there. Any other questions? Okay. Then I do want to dive into one potential, well, actually, some of the theories that have been brought up for what might cause sea star wasting syndrome. And if you all need to go, you are welcome to go. You can go back outside and get cookies and lemonade if you'd like. But since this kind of came up, I want to um, touch on it a little bit. It shouldn't take too long. Oh, uh oh. I pressed escape oh. um, instead of the arrow. Um, but there are sort of okay, we can we can fix this. Oh no, we're gonna go from the beginning. Have you heard of any rose stars? being seen post die off? I have not. Maybe. Um, I, I have not found one, but you know, there's a lot more people out there than mine. Yeah. So. Rainbow stars, Stimson sun stars, and morning sun stars, blood stars, yes. Um, I, I have heard, but I didn't, it was from like a 10 year old oh, okay. and I wasn't entirely, no, no adults or other 10 year olds had actually seen it. So I don't <laughs> entirely trust the, the source, but it's possible. Um, so there are a few different kind of possibilities for what might be causing sea star wasting syndrome. In 2014, um, a research group based out of Cornell with Ian Hewson um, did identify a densovirus, a sea star associated densovirus that they thought might be causing sea star wasting syndrome. And they did lots of different uh, research on this virus. And initially it was pointing pretty strongly to yes, this was the cause, but uh, as more time went on, they were able to spend more energy, not on the immediate like, oh my gosh, there's a crisis going on. We have to try and figure out what's going on, but dive a little bit deeper into um, untangling some of the bits of information. They started to question, um, the research team themselves, as well as other researchers started to question how um, accurate this idea of the denso virus was. And so that's still being um, discussed and figured out. 
Um, it might be another pathogen, uh, another bacteria or virus or um, parasite that's involved. And uh, I've heard murmurs that there um, may be some disease research that's happening and they're looking for host sites in Alaska. Um, and there are possibilities. Kasitsna Bay Lab here in Kachemak Bay was on the list of possible places to explore for doing a pathogen or infectious agent based study on the sea stars in, the, in this area. Um, environmental factors have definitely, all sorts of different environmental factors have been brought up and researched individually and in combination. And so far there isn't one clear cut answer. Um, water temperature has been highlighted, um, warmer water temperature particularly has been highlighted um, as a significant problem, especially for sunflower stars, but how closely that's related to um, sea star wasting syndrome uh, remains to be sort of untangled and peeled out. And then there's a new theory um, from Dr. Houston's lab that's in peer review right now. So there's some papers that you can read that haven't been peer reviewed yet. And he sent us an overview that I'm gonna share with you all. Um, it has a very long name, boundary layer oxygen diffusion limitation hypothesis. Um, so boundary layers refer to, when we're talking about water, you've got water moving, like, you know, current going past, and then you've got a surface. As that water begins to interact with the surface, um, the water right next to the surface isn't going to be moving as much as the water up higher. So that's the boundary layer. It gets slowed down as it touches the surface of the sea star or maybe the bottom of the ocean or kelp or whatever it may be. And the bumpier that surface is, the bigger that boundary layer is. Um, so that's going to play an important role here when we talk about how this affects sea stars differently. Oxygen diffusion is the movement of oxygen from areas of high concentration to lower concentration. And limitation means that it's not happening as much or there's a constraint on it. So if we kind of break it down, it's this hypothesis that for some reason, the water of moving along the surface of something is limited and therefore oxygen isn't moving as much from the water into the, in this case, the sea star. So kind of where does this idea come from? Well, um, in lab experiments that they did, they actually exposed sea stars with to water that had less oxygen in it, and then they dumped in organic matter, so decaying plankton or zooplankton poop or whatever, and that induced symptoms or signs of sea star wasting syndrome. Um, and the explanation for this is that as bacteria at the surface of the sea star decay that organic matter, they use up oxygen. And so it creates a zone along the top of the sea star um, that is hypoxic, that doesn't have much oxygen in it. And that ends up killing off the tissues of the sea star in that area. And in the field, going back and now looking at observations and data that were collected when sea star wasting syndrome was really happening, um, they've been able to look at it and see, oh, well, from these samples of the bacteria on the surface of the sea stars, we now see that sea stars with wasting had much more anaerobic or bacteria that can function without oxygen, much more anaerobic bacteria on their surface than healthy sea stars. So that starts to point to this idea of there's maybe not enough oxygen going on. And that bacteria was present a little bit before signs of wasting um, happened. So it's not like, oh, these sea stars are dying and the anaerobic bacteria show up to decompose them. The anaerobic bacteria show up and then the sea stars start to die. Is this connected? Um, and where the environmental information is available, it looks like wasting tended to happen right after there was a big pulse of organic matter into the system. So whether that was an algal bloom or some other event that depleted oxygen or a big upwelling event that brought organic matter up from the bottom of the ocean, it seems like those things can happen. And then shortly thereafter, as that organic matter would be decaying is when signs of sea star wasting syndrome really started to pop up. Um, and looking at stable isotope analysis of the sea stars, they're able to find out that the sea stars were stressed. Specifically, they were oxygen stressed. Um, many of the sea stars that were showing um, signs of sea star wasting symptoms. And there's a lot of ants here. Um, it tends to be sea stars that have faster respiratory rates 
that were affected most by C star wasting syndrome and C stars with a bumpier surface. So we think about that here, things like sunflower stars that have a very, what's called corrugated surface. So it's got lots of cracks and crevices in it. As the water flows way up here, a lot of that water gets trapped in those crevices. And so you don't have as much new water with higher levels of oxygen getting to basically the gills of the sea star. And so it's more likely that they would suffer from this oxygen deprivation than smooth sea stars where you're constantly getting new water pushed over them. Um, which also goes back to this question about otter rock, right? Like you've got waves crashing, do we end up with higher overall oxygen content in the water, which may or may not apply in this case. This is still, this theory has not been peer reviewed yet and there's still lots of questions about it and it's very much up for debate, but it's interesting in our context thinking about the few sites that we have information from. Um, okay. I can add that a part of kind of, uh, not validity, but the fact that we were seeing so many leopard stars that were not seemingly affected by secret wasting and they have the very smooth. And I, I just remember that being a question of why aren't they being affected as much as these other sea stars? And so that kind of. And uh, one other thing that I was just reading recently that Dr. Houston sent me is also surface area to volume ratio. Mm -hmm. um, and leather stars and then bat stars farther south were another species that didn't seem to be affected as much. And they're like, they're really wow. flat and they kind of have like webbed feet basically. So they have much broader rays. Um, so a lot more surface area to volume than compared to something like a true star, you know, a blood star that has these teeny tiny little rays extending. Um, and the environmental drivers of this, if you look at the broad scale patterns, when sea star wasting syndrome was really hitting hard in California, Washington, and Oregon, it was a time where in many places there were major uh, large algal blooms um, at, and or these major upwelling events. And since then, there's been kind of a pattern of seasonal die-offs in some places that also kind of follow these cycles of when algal blooms or coastal runoff is happening. Um, so it's not a for sure situation yet, but there's a lot of evidence pointing that this hypothesis of a very specific environmental factor may um, explain at least some of what's going on with sea star wasting syndrome. Um, and one of the things that makes this so hard to untangle is it does really, it seems like it's infectious because when you find one sea star dead, a few days later you find more and more and more and it kind of snowballs and that, and you know, a logical mind is like, oh, it must be infectious. It must be spreading from one sea star to the next. But if that sea star is rotting away, that process is taking more oxygen out of the environment. It could also be snowballing this lack of oxygen effect. So there's a lot of questions, um, but it's pretty interesting, very different uh, idea than the initial hypothesis of a virus being involved. And we'll see where it goes from here and what, um, what questions and answers researchers can provide into the future. There definitely are still many, many researchers out there that think it is a pathogen and that we just haven't identified the right one yet. So I don't want all of this information to make you think it is only an environmental factor. There is a lot of um, argument out there still that there's a pathogen involved. Uh, this, this, it also does validate an observation I made during or shortly after the major die off, which was our touch tank stars not dying. Uh, so with the water being sucked out of the same area where you're getting dying stars, and then going through pipes and a pump, you, uh, you, you know, it makes sense. It's not necessarily it doesn't make sense. I know that a lot of um, some of the initial die-offs were happening in aquaria and touch tank mm -hmm. environments. Um, so I don't think that that precludes it from happening, <laughs> um, but it may be the particular irregularities of our saltwater pumping system, which is not the most efficient, so maybe introducing way more oxygen into the system. Well, plus maybe, I mean, some of those other aquaria maybe aren't, um, you know, flushing fresh seawater all the time, even more of an aquarium type. Okay. I was going to ask, um, so with some of this information then, has anybody gone back to look at kind of the environmental conditions for that summer of 2016, especially like some months, like to 
but right before that, I mean, because it was drafted. It really was. It was like they were there, and then everybody was like, "What happened to the team drive? Like, where did they go?" Tomorrow, you know, the next day. So, like, you know, was there a big plankton blooming at that time? I don't know. Yeah. So I don't think because this is so um, new and hasn't been published in a peer-reviewed journal yet. Um, I don't think anyone has looked specifically at those pieces in Kachemak Bay. And, um, you know, realistically, we're a very small piece of a much bigger picture. But there is a lot of research that's happening in Kachemak Bay, and it would be really interesting uh, to look more into that. And there's some pretty solid information available through the Kachemak Bay NER and through NOAA and the Kasitsuna Bay Lab, what they're doing around um, Plankton and algal blooms that you might be able to um, make some make some pretty interesting analyses. Of this. Yeah, I think it sounds like a good cultural <laughs> little research yeah. project. You know, to look at some of their data and see how it matches up. And I know that's one thing. There's a lot of interest in kind of the Alaskan sea star or intertidal research community is pulling together different data streams. So pulling together temperature data and algal bloom data and, um, you know, information from the surveys we've done and what they've collected with Gulf Watch and the Fire and Ice Project and even, like, photographs that people have of what beaches look like before and after and trying to kind of narrow in on, okay, yeah, what was going on here um, and what is going on here now. And even though no individual entity or organization has all of the pieces to answer those questions. Um, the exciting thing is that if we really start working together and collaborating, we might have quite a few of the pieces um, to start answering some of those questions at least, or at least knowing which questions to ask, um, which I think in many ways we're still on that stage of understanding the sea star Any other questions? I have lots. I'm not an expert on this topic, but I'm happy to share um, what we have learned and, and information from some of our collaborators and partners as well. Well, thank you all. We'll go back to the thank you slide. Thank you, Katie. Goodbye, people on the live stream. <laughs> How many people were? Uh, we had a peak of three. Three? Yeah. Three. Woo! Awesome. With my broken leg.